about uh, an Indian word, karma, which is uh, frequently used in this country. I first came to United States in the early 60s to go to a university here on the East Coast, and I met a lot of people who talked about karma. I found there were people seeking the truth, people seeking themselves, people seeking God. And I saw one common thing on their faces, they all looked very sad. They had long faces, drooping, hands held up, and they looked very sad, unhappy. That puzzled me. If somebody is seeking the truth, somebody is on a great pursuit of finding the Lord of his creation. If somebody is trying to discover himself or herself, how could that pursuit make anybody sad or unhappy? So I couldn't understand it, so I questioned a number of people, what makes you so sad when you are pursuing the fountainhead of happiness and joy and beauty and love? What makes you sad? And they told me, we are paying off our karma, and that's why we are unhappy. Over the years, I have heard several people telling me how it is their karma that things are happening, and therefore they are unhappy and sad. I wonder if they know what karma means, because it is a borrowed word. An Indian yogi came here, he tried to talk about karma. Nobody understood what he was saying. A cartoon appeared in a magazine in which they showed a big van bringing up some kind of a beverage, like a Pepsi van, and serving oceans of that in glasses and tumblers to people. It is called karma cola. I saw all kinds of interpretations of the word karma. One of the incarnations of the god Vishnu, the god of sustenance in Indian mythology, appeared in the form of Krishna. And a group claiming to be approaching Krishna consciousness or the same level of awareness that Krishna had. And Krishna had an awareness of great happiness, great joy, of great frivolity. If you read the history and the life of Krishna, you'll be surprised. He had a good time with all the gopis, the girls of his village, who used to follow him when he used to take his cows out to graze. That joyful personality who brought happiness to everybody, even his name was used to teach the karma of unhappiness and sadness. Because when he spoke to his principal disciple Arjun on the battlefield of Mahabharata, in words which are today called the Gita, he invoked this word and he said, Arjun, karma is a yoga. And what is yoga? We all teach you yoga. Yoga is karma in a skilled way, action in a skilled way without bothering about the rewards thereof is yoga, highest yoga. If you can perform action with the best of skill that you have and not bother about the results, you are a yogi. You have then a qualification to meet God himself. He described it so beautifully. But here I met those who in the name of Krishna also thought karma was something bad to be put up with, to cope up with. Somehow you have to stay with it. It's part of your life. You can't do anything without about it. Let us set the record straight first. What is karma? The word karma means action. There's no other meaning of it. It only means action. A whole philosophy has been built about action because it is assumed that human beings can act and on their action depends their life. When you assume that somebody can act, you have to assume that the person who can act has a choice to act one way or the other. If you had no choice, you could not act. You could perform, you could go monotonously according to a pre-programmed tape that was put in you, but if you had no choice, you could not be responsible for any action. 
a human being becomes responsible for action only if he has a choice. Therefore, when the philosophy of karma was propounded, it was implicit in the philosophy that human beings have a choice and the choice they make determines the happiness of their life. Now, this is the subject of today's lecture. Do we have choice? Do we have free will? Or are we merely puppets in a large play being enacted on the stage of creation and somebody else pulls the strings? That's a million dollar question. A question I have referred to over and over again in the past 20 years or 25 years that I have been speaking in this country. The question is, do we have free will? And if we have no free will, does there still subsist a philosophy of karma which makes us responsible for our actions? There is a contradiction in terms if you say you are responsible for your actions, but you have no choice how to act. How can you be responsible? You can only be responsible if you have different choices and you can make a choice. What then is the reality of this dilemma? We don't seem to have any free will and yet we seem to have free will. We don't seem to be responsible for what is happening and yet we are being burdened with responsibility. What is the truth of the matter? We are going to address ourselves to these questions tonight. First of all, I will tell you my encounter with a young man in Boston who made a deep study of this question of free will. He concerned himself with the will of God, the creator, and the will of the individual. And he wanted to examine whether God has given us some limited will to work in so that he lays down the larger plan and we work out a small will within that and is that the human will, human free will which makes for karma. He examined this very carefully after going into all available attributes of God. For instance, one of the attributes given to God by all religions and all believers in God throughout the world is that he is omniscient, all-knowing that he knows before a thing has happened, that nothing happens without his knowledge. If this is true, and we presume it is true, that God is all-knowing, and then he gives a little bit of free will to one human being, and that human being can then decide to go right or left, then God cannot be all-knowing. If God knows that even if I let this human being decide whether to go right or left, but I will see to it that he goes right because that is my knowledge, then man has no real free will. Can you really resolve this contradiction that God is all-knowing and yet he has given free will or an ability freely to choose between different alternatives? If the choice is real, God cannot be all-knowing. If the choice is not real and God is all-knowing, there is no real free will. What is the truth? That friend of mine in Boston examined this thoroughly and he came to the conclusion that because God's attribute of being all-knowing is universal, therefore he must accept it. Therefore, human beings have no free will. And he was so astonished at this wonderful conclusion he came to that he came running to me, Eureka, Eureka, he had found the real truth. He came to my apartment and said, I have found out we have no free will at all. So I said, come on, cool down, sit down here. And I asked the girl who was working as my secretary for work in those days, I said, will you on a, on a tray bring a cup of tea and a cup of coffee? And she brought on a tray a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. And I said to my friend, my friend, either take tea or coffee, or neither, but don't use your free will because you don't have any. You just told me, you came to the great discovery that you have no free will. Now I want you to tell me what do you want. 
and you don't, don't use your free will, you don't have any. And he was stumped because whether he said no or yes, it meant he was using free will. After a while, he said, you have destroyed my great conclusion by merely a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. How come I had examined the issue from a metaphysical angle, from a rational angle, and I convinced myself, man cannot have free will in the presence of an all-knowing God. And how come you destroyed this great belief and conclusion merely by producing a cup of tea and a cup of coffee? And I said to him, you say you have no free will, and I say to you, you cannot get out of free will. Try and escape. Because when you came running to me and told me I have no free will, my dear friend, you were using your free will to say that. You had the choice and option to say you have free will. You could say you have no free will. Freely you decided to come and tell me you have no free will. You are demonstrating the inescapability of free will by the very act of coming to me and saying you have no free will. I merely corroborated that by a further demonstration, by bringing a cup of tea and coffee to you. I can take you through life minute by minute, moment by moment and tell you every moment you are on the crossroad. Should I or should I not do this? Which one of us has not passed through this? Is there anybody sitting here who has not had to make a decision whether to move in this direction or that? Even to come to listen to a talk on whether we have free will or no free will, be examined. Should we waste our time there or no? Free will. How come free will is so prevalent, is so much there that we can't escape it? We are thrown right in front of options and choices, which are real. We can see that these roads and alternatives lead to different directions. And we know we can go either one of them. We look at all the alternatives. We deliberate upon them. We examine the pros and cons of each alternative. We examine the ethical nature of it, what is good and what is bad. We want to do that is good and therefore we classify the choices as good and bad. How can we be moral people making decisions and say we have no free will? If you had no free will, how could morality exist at all? If you had no choice to make, how could you say you are doing good or bad? Then you say, I don't want to do something evil. I don't want to do something bad. Are you not using your free will? Are you not assuming that you have the choice to do good or evil? When you have the very experience of ethics and morality, how can you escape from the conclusion that you have free will? Therefore, when we face a life situation in which we make choices, when we face a living drama in which some things are good and some things are bad and we are trying to do that is good and avoid that which is bad, it assumes that we have free will. There is no other way. The law of karma, the philosophy of karma is propounded on this basis. Karma is as you sow, so shall you reap. If you do good deeds, you will be rewarded. If you do bad deeds, you will be punished. Therefore, do good deeds. That is the law of karma. The law of karma says, if you do a bad deed, you have to come back in order to pay for it. The punishment may not be immediate. You may do a good deed and run away to heaven without waiting for a reward here. You may do a bad deed and die without the punishment. Therefore, the Eastern philosophers propounded that you must be born over and over again in order to settle your accounts, good and bad. You must be rewarded for good deeds. You must be punished for bad deeds. Therefore, you must keep on coming and going. So the law of karma in Eastern philosophy assumes reincarnation, assumes that we have a choice, assumes free will, and assumes that we are running in this cycle again and again because of our actions. And there is no way by which we can live a life without action. Because when we decide not to act, it is action. Action 
in the philosophy of karma is not physical action, only mental action. If you mentally decide to do a thing, you have done it. If you physically do it and your mind doesn't know, you have not done it. If you sleepwalk, there is no karma. If in your mind you say, I am walking there, you have done it. The whole philosophy of karma is based upon mental action. As you act in your mind, so shall you be rewarded or punished. Therefore, the law of karma as propounded in the East is a basis for continuous survival life after life. If there was no basis of this type, how would we come back again? There is no way. People have sometimes tried to analyze whether this belief in reincarnation is essential to understanding karma. It is probably not essential. If you assume that there is life somewhere else, then you can be taken care of elsewhere. If you have a heaven and a hell, and this is one period of living on the physical earth that you are given, and you have karma, good and bad, you can be punished and rewarded in the hell or heaven. But if there is no other life, no conscious living anywhere else, it's impossible to have the law of karma. Therefore, either you have life somewhere else or you have reliving over here, you have to have life hereafter. Then, is it necessary only to have life hereafter or do we also have to have life earlier? Well, to, in order to explain what is happening here, we have to have life earlier also. This question was asked from Jesus. As you, those of you who have read the Bible know about it, when the blind child was brought before the master and the question was put, why is this child blind? What has he done? Why should he be born blind? Is it because of his sins or because of the sins of his father that he is born blind? And the master replied, it is neither for his sins nor for the sins of his father. It is so that the law may prevail. It's for the law. And if you read about this law, which we now interpret in the East as the law of karma, you find there has to be a prior living as much as a post living in the, after the physical life. Therefore, in the East, the mystics came to the automatic conclusion, there has to be life before being born here, there has to be life after we die here, and those lives are governed by the law of karma. Whatever we did in the past makes us do things here or makes us go through experiences here. You read about Edgar Cayce's life. When I first read about Edgar Cayce, I was a little astonished because I found that having been brought up in a religious tradition, he never believed in reincarnation. And what started as a simple, strange experience of his loosening his tie, sitting on a bench and going to sleep and speaking in the plural, we have come we can see this. Apart from these statements he made, there was nothing very startling. But when he would in that state of sleep say, we have come, we can see that your mother is cooking pancakes today and she was cooking pancakes, it became startling. Who was that who was seen in his body? As he made more and more of those statements and you know about it, he never knew what statements he made. Every time he woke up from his trance, he had to ask, what did I say today? And his friends told him what he said. And one day, when he told one person, when he had become famous and everybody knew, he had a strange gift, a strange power, which normal human beings don't have, that he can get into a trance and speak strange things as if he crosses time and space and reaches out somewhere and can talk about things somewhere else. When he told somebody, you are sick because you did something wrong in a past life. Not only were the listeners astonished, when he got out of the trance, he refused to believe that he said it. After that, there were hundreds of readings which Edgar Casey gave, in which he talked of past lives because questions were then specifically put. Not only he gave answers to past lives in the same human form, he pinned them down to specific periods in history, that as if there was a life exactly at the same level of developed civilization 3,000 years ago and one that was 10,000 years ago and he talked of the Atlantis city 
as if many things that people did there were responsible for what was happening to them today in the century on planet earth. It was a strange experience. I was surprised when I found that uh, somebody in the east coast of this country could say these things. We thought this was reserved for eastern mysticism. Somebody in this country, born in this country, in a different culture, with a different background, not believing in this thing, said all these things. It was strange. And yet, what he said, the way he described the law of karma was identical with the law of karma which has been talked of for thousands of years in India and other countries. The point is, you cannot explain the disparities of human beings. You cannot explain the various events that are coming unless you assume that there is something, some area of time in which we also have the ability to act and there is an area of time hereafter in which we must also have the ability to act otherwise we leave with an unaccounted, unsettled account. Therefore, reincarnation coming into human life again and again has been accepted as almost a concomitant of the law of karma. But the strangest part is that if we are not human, can we then create karma? Maybe we were angels up in heaven. Maybe we were with God, God's children living somewhere else, not on this earth at all. Could we have created karma there and come here on this planet to pay it off or to get the rewards? Or could it be that we were animals and trees and plants and insects and we created karma at that time and therefore we have come into human being form to pay off or receive the reward? If you examine these, you will find it is not possible to create karma except as a human being. Why? Because that tea cup and coffee cup that I offered to my friends would have no effect on an insect, on a plant, on an animal or even on an angel. An angel would know what he has to take. He is programmed. He has knowledge. He is with God. He has full knowledge. There is no choice available to him. Plants have no choice. They are programmed instinctively to do what the instinct tells them. Animals will do instinctively what the instinct directs them. It is a computerized program for everything except a human being. Therefore, there can be no form in which living consciousness, the soul or spirit could create karma except as a human being. Therefore, if in this life we are paying off karma, it must have been created either in this very life or in another life similar to if not identical to a human life. This is explained over and over again that all other forms of life are there only to pay off karma. You cannot create any karma. Only in a human life can you create karma. Why? Only in a human life do you experience free will. Free will is the very basis of creating karma. If you had no free will, you could not create karma. If you had no free will, you could not be rewarded or punished for anything that you do. Therefore, creation of karma is linked to its free will. Now, my friend who came running to me saying he had no free will, got convinced after this conversation that he has free will. Not only got convinced after the tea and coffee, but after hearing all the things that I have talked to you today, which I talked to him, he got convinced that he must have free will. All the events of life, of all his friend's life, of every other human being in you, convinced him that we must be having some free will that we create these actions for which we accept responsibility and either we are rewarded or punished. After we had gone through this exercise, I went back to him and I said, look, I don't want to disappoint you because you have come to a great metaphysical truth and I am with you and the truth is we have no free will at all. And I said, I stand by this truth and I stand by your original statement, we have no free will at all because if we had, we have to denounce God. We cannot have an all-knowing God and yet have free will. Therefore, we really have no free will. He was shocked after all these explanations I should give about the inevitability of free will, that karma cannot exist without free will. After all the explanations, I should say the truth is that we have no free will. Then he naturally asked me, does it also mean the truth is there is no karma? I said, yes, the truth is there is no karma. The truth is that none of these things exist. He said, does it also mean the truth is there is no morality and ethics? I said, the truth is there is no morality and ethics. 
because you cannot have one truth picked up from these and another truth to justify free will. You must have the whole package. If you have free will, you will have karma, you will have ethics, morality. If you have no free will, you cannot have karma, you cannot have any ethics. There is no other way. You have to take the whole package. You cannot take part of it and say, I will fit it in with something else. There is no way. But then what is the truth? Why should I say this particular package which says we have no free will is more true than the package which says we have free will, we have karma and we have ethics? Why is the other alternative more true in my eyes and in the eyes of my friend? Just because we believe in the universality of this attribute we give to God, the creator, that he is all-knowing. If he shared free will with anyone else, he would no longer be God. God must have God's will in totality. God's will, his will must prevail in totality. If a little bit of that will is taken away by somebody, even the slightest bit of it is no longer total, cannot be God anymore. On this simple assumption, we come to the conclusion, only God has free will, no one else has free will. Then how did we, how do we justify the law of karma? How do we justify? Then I had to go back to coffee and tea again. And I said to my friend, listen, I gave you the option to freely choose either tea or coffee. What is the meaning of free choice? Free choice means don't listen to me, don't listen to anybody else. Whatever comes into your head, do that. That is free choice. What does free choice really mean? So when I gave him the option of free choice, he had to really choose between two alternatives in which his own mind was already pre-judged, pre preconditioned. Let us see how he chose coffee. He decided after using his free will, to choose coffee. Can you still hear me? No free will here. Okay. Those who can't hear, I'll repeat. When my friend decided to take coffee, how did he decide freely? What is the freedom that was available to him that made him decide coffee? I asked him, what freedom do you have which makes you decide coffee? And he said, I don't know. I thought over it and I said, I would like a cup of coffee. It is simple. I like it. So, lot of things we do freely because we like them. And why do we like things? We like things because the system that works in our head, in our brain, in our mind to choose between alternatives is based upon preferences built into it. And those preferences are governed by factors that we carry in our mind. And those factors may be, my father may like coffee, I will like coffee because the preference for coffee has come into my genes genetically, hereditary. Or I have lived so long in this country amongst coffee drinkers, I acquired a taste for coffee. Therefore, the factors of choice might have been acquired. I explained to my friend that all the factors of choice we have in our head, all of them can be classified either into hereditary factors or environmental or acquired factors. There was no factor of preference outside these categories. Therefore, when we say we are freely choosing something, we are really saying we are choosing our course based upon the hereditary and environmental factors which govern our preference and choice. Which in other words means that whatever my genetic structure at this moment of choice is, whatever environment I have been exposed to up to this point, that is making the decision for me. I explained to my friend that if I fed this input into my computer, what your factors hereditary and genetic are, as well as the environmental are, the computer would have told me that he will take only coffee, freely. He has no choice to take tea because those factors of choice are already fixed. You cannot change your birth. You cannot change your parentage. You cannot change your genetics. You cannot change your genes now, nor can you change the environment through which you have passed up to the moment you decided between tea and coffee. Therefore, although 
it looked to my friend that he had free will to choose between tea and coffee. When he tried to choose freely, he could come to no conclusion but coffee. Had he come to another conclusion that he liked tea, he would have gone against free will. He would not have been acting freely. Therefore, when we say we act freely to choose something, we are in fact being governed by the conditions through which we have already passed. So, we really have no free will. But it looks like free will. Why does this choice making look like free will? Because we are ignorant of our own self. If we have knowledge of our own self, if we could have knowledge and say, how do these factors of choice operate in us? We would have really no free will. Knowledge about oneself destroys free will. Whereas ignorance of oneself generates the feeling of free will. Therefore, free will is an illusion. It is an illusion that lasts as long as we are ignorant about ourselves. If that is so, then there is no real contradiction between the statement that God alone has free will and the statement that individual feels he has free will. There is no contradiction. His will is real because he has knowledge. He set up the plan. He set up where we are to be born. He set up the whole show. And we feel we have free will because we are ignorant how he set it up. What did he set up in us? Therefore, there is no real contradiction between the two and the free will that we experience is the free will of ignorance. So long as we are ignorant about ourselves, we will continue to feel we have choices to make. And so long as we continue to feel we have choices to make, we will continue to go through the similar illusion of karma. And so long as we go through the illusion of karma, we will go through pain and pleasure, punishment and reward. That's what makes the polarity, the duality of life. So long as this ignorance is there, the whole package remains intact and we feel we have free will, we have good and evil, we have choices to make and the choices we make give us the reward or the punishment and we go through life like that. When does this illusion go away? When does the real truth come to us? The real truth only comes to us when we pierce through the veil of ignorance about ourselves. If we can go within, see how we operate. How do these things happen inside us? Then it is all broken. The illusion is broken. And we find it was all a nice play set up. Now, this is the conclusion of ignorance that if we are ignorant, we feel we have free will. And if we get knowledge, we find God alone has knowledge. Now, a more subtle point comes in. The more subtle point is if we really get knowledge about ourselves, within ourselves, what would we find? We would find there is no other God except our own total self. Therefore, the illusion that God is separate from us is amongst the package of illusion that we have free will. To separate the creator from our own self, this illusion is also created by the same ignorance. Because we think we are individual, separate. This show is too sophisticated, too complicated for us to run. Somebody else must be running it. By presuming there must be somebody else outside of ourselves running the show, we separate God from ourselves. And then in ignorance we say we have free will, he must also have free will. When we break the ignorance, we discover only God has free will and God is our own totality. We have no separate existence. In other words, if you can separate your soul from God, you can also separate free will from God. If God does not remain God, if some free will of his is taken away, how can he remain God if some souls are taken away? When I was young and people told me about a spiritual path in which we could go back to our heavenly home and be with our heavenly father and merge in him, people said it with great rejoicing. It's a great thing to do, to go back and merge in the great ocean that we are like little drops our souls are little drops separated from the ocean and our job in this universe is to somehow go back and merge in the ocean. People were trying that with great happiness, but I was very sad at this very thought. The concept didn't appeal to me. I said to myself, if I am a drop of water 
and the water, the totality of water, that ocean is God. At least I am a drop now. I have an entity, a personality, a separate unit of existence, of consciousness. I am somebody. If I go and merge with God, what will happen? I will lose all that I have. Nothing will be left. And what will he gain? Ocean will gain nothing by one drop added to it. Neither he gains nor I gain. Who, who, what game is this? Who is playing it? Didn't appeal to me at all. That we are little souls, drops from the ocean, separated from the Lord. We have to go back all the time and merge and get our satisfaction in having merged in the Lord. Didn't make sense to me. Till I realized the fallacy of the very statement that how could I be separated from God? How could any one of us be separate? and still say the God is perfect and total. There could be no separation unless the separation is illusion, unreal. And that's what I found. What is the truth, the reality? The reality and truth is we were never separated from God. The illusion is we are separate. It looks like we are separate. The reality is we have no free will. The illusion is it looks like we have. The reality is there is no morality or ethics. The illusion is yes, we cannot do without good and evil. So the reality was oneness, that there is only one, there cannot be more than one. If you presume that there is more than one real conscious being, you destroy all the attributes we have given to God so far. None of those attributes, whether he is omnipresent or omnipotent or omniscient, will apply at all to him. The moment you break that oneness, and the truth, please repeat again and again, the truth is oneness. How can we destroy that oneness and still say we are true? We have to say we are in illusion whenever we are not in oneness. If there is only one God and he alone is alive, he alone is conscious, he alone is total soul, it is true. If we say some soul separated from him and live separately, it is illusion, unreal. He said, there is only one God, it is his play, his will, and that alone can prevail, it is true. If we say no in competition, we are also trying to compete with God, we also have a little bit of free will, partial free will, limited free will, it is illusion, non-real. Therefore, the illusion was created in order that the illusory play may go on, but the reality of oneness never disappeared, never became less. Oneness and truth remains the same, continues to remain the same, will always remain the same, will never change. What is this realization of oneself? What is God realization? What is self realization? It is nothing else but to accept and find out within yourself that there was always one. Not that you become one, you discover you were one. It is different from becoming one. When you realize through a spiritual growth, your own totality, you realize the oneness of the only being that exists. You do not become one, you realize the oneness which was always there. And if you know this oneness was always there, it remains the truth. What is truth? When we talk of truth, there are so many. You make a statement, it is consistent with what another person has said, you say it is true. Inconsistent, it is not true. But what is really true? What is really true is what is always consistent. And that alone is always consistent, which never changes. Whatever changes must be untrue. Apply this test. If you want to find out what is the truth, find out what does not change. That is the truth. And whatever changes must be untrue. Look at everything around you. Look at all life's experiences and find out is there something that does not change. And what do we find? Every experience of a human being changes. Every experience, every day it changes, from morning till night, from night to morning, it changes. Therefore, it cannot be true. Our choices change, they cannot be true. Our free will changes, it cannot be true. Everything in our life changes, it cannot be true. Every experience we have on this planet in time and space changes. Therefore, it cannot be true. Then what is true? Have we ever noticed that we are having an experience of something that never changes? All of us are having that. In the midst of this change, in the midst of a changing experience, we are all having an experience that never changes. And that is the experience of the one 
who is having the experience? Consciousness per se. If we did not have one single continuous unchanging consciousness, we could never have the experience of a changing, changing life and changing event. Therefore, the experience is untrue. The experiencer is true, which is consciousness. And the totality of experiencer, consciousness, which is one, has never changed. Every day we see the experience changing, but that one does not change. Where is that one? The one that is seeing everything through all of us, through all our eyes. But our eyes are changing. Therefore, eyes are not real. But the consciousness that picks up the message of seeing is real never changes. The one that sees never changes, but what you see changes. The one that listens never changes, but what you listen changes. Therefore, if we were to move from that which we see, hear, touch, taste and smell back to that which is hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, having the perception, having the experience, we will find the truth of that one. Why does, why do I say that is only one? Because there is nobody sitting here or anywhere else in creation who has experienced more than two directly as experiences. When you say, why? We are so many people here. Aren't we all experiences? No, we aren't. Only one, each one of us, but one is the experiencer. The others are part of his experience or our experience. It is just like going into sleep and having a dream. When you see a lot of people in the dream, how many are dreaming? Only one. The others are part of the dream. If you saw a dream and saw 20 people there and you say, there is only one dreamer. That's why you are all there. You say, of course not. What about the others? Are the others also there? When do you find out that in any dream, any dream whatsoever, there is only one dreamer? When do you find that out? When you wake up. That's the only time you find out. Therefore, if this looks like so many little, little souls and consciousnesses, little individual units moving around, it looks like that only so long as we are in a dream state. When we wake up to a higher reality, we find that the consciousness is only one. Has always been one. It was never two, never more than one. It looked like more than one because we were dreaming, because we were not fully awake. Therefore, when we say self-realization is to go within yourself and find the truth, it means when you discover your own self, you will find there was only one self. And the many selves that looked like different selves were created in illusion, not in reality or truth. So only that is true which is conscious and when you go into consciousness and not in the covers of consciousness, you find the truth and reality. If you want to find out the truth about yourself, it's very easy. Go back to your own self in consciousness. Say to yourself, I am conscious. That is why I am thinking. I am conscious. That is why when I open my eyes, I can see. If I am unconscious, I can't see. But I can see through my eyes. I must be conscious. I am conscious, therefore I can hear. I am conscious, therefore I can remember. I am conscious, therefore I can imagine. I am conscious, therefore I can feel. I am conscious, therefore I can pursue and seek and study. Where is this consciousness coming from? If that consciousness is my real self, my real me, where is it? Let me go where consciousness comes from and not stay with the skin of my body and the bones of this, of this frame. Let me go within or outside or wherever it is. The moment you start that pursuit, you will find there is no place outside to go. Consciousness has never left the body. It has never operated from outside the body. It's operating from inside. Therefore, you must go inside through attention. If we want to go somewhere without moving the body, the body not being our real self, how do we go? We go with attention. If we want to go and listen to the other people, we can with attention go there without leaving our chairs here. Attention gives us a mobility to go wherever we like, including within ourselves. If we were to pursue this and say, let us go deep into ourselves and find out where is this fountainhead of consciousness coming from? Let me see what is the truth there. And we go within ourselves, we'll find that in the 
middle of our head is a assumed spot which looks like the focal point from where our conscious faculties are proceeding. And it would not be very difficult to go behind the eyes into the center of the head and find out that we were never the body and the body was just a frame put on top of us. If we were to stay with this exercise or this pursuit, this journey, a journey to our own self, we would find that we would go beyond our senses, even the perceptions we would go beyond that and find that consciousness is not perception, it goes deeper than that. If we can leave our senses, we find that the mind, the thinking process will go on without the senses. We are still conscious. If we go deep into our thoughts, into the center of them and say, where are these thoughts coming from? And we go in the same direction within ourselves, we will find that thoughts become external to us. We are not the thoughts, we are not the mind, but we are still conscious. And when in that isolation of our own consciousness, we still go within and find out where are these coming out from? Where is this whole consciousness experience coming from? If it is not even the mind, we go within and when we are left with nothing except consciousness, we say this must be the soul. There is no mind here and yet we are surrounded by an illusion of separateness. If we leave the separateness of the soul and go within consciousness, we find there is only one consciousness. There always was one and that was called God. Any one of you can find out. I am not saying an impossible thing. I am saying try it out. If you come to some other conclusion, come and teach me, I will learn from you. If you can come to another conclusion, that if you go deep into your own consciousness, you will come to the center of anything else but total consciousness, which is one. I will relearn my lessons. But if you find that you come to the same conclusion, the same experience of a single consciousness, which is total, in which every experience, including the experience of creation of millions of people is included, including the experience of creating of millions of universes is included. If you find that single consciousness has all the universes in it, what else can you call it but God? And how can you then distinguish between self-realization and God-realization? What have all these mystics and yogis and spiritual teachers been telling us? They have been telling us in their own way in their own words, according to the time and country in which they spoke, they have been telling us, if you want to find the truth, go within yourself. All the kingdoms are within the, yourself, including the kingdom of God, including God himself is inside you. That's what they have been saying. What have we done? We never went inside. We listened to them. We looked for things outside. If we had followed the same pursuit which they gave us, Go within and you will find all the truth within yourself. Then you will find that there is no real contradiction between free will of a human being and the lack of free will. Why? Because you will find when a human being is ignorant and thinks he is separate, he gets the real feeling of free will which is not real but is illusion created by the ignorance of who he is. When he becomes fully aware of himself, he discovers that he is indeed having free will, but not in the human form, but in the form of totality, which is God, which is the real form. Therefore, we are now going deeper. We are not only saying that only in illusion we feel free. From illusion to partial knowledge, we lose free will. When we get partial knowledge of the limitations that ignorance imposes upon us, then we lose the experience of free will. But when we get full knowledge, the experience of free will comes back again. Because full knowledge means we are in reality the same one. There are no two. Partial knowledge is that we are one amongst many and the many are all part of one whom we have not found yet. That's partial knowledge. Therefore, there are two good positions, vantage positions to get free will. One vantage position is the human being, the human life, because in this alone can you get the illusion that you have a choice to make and you are free. The second vantage position is to be total, to be God, to be one with God, to discover your ultimate reality. Then you find you really have free will. 
you set it up you set up the whole drama yourself between the two positions they are disadvantageous position therefore many angels divine beings disembodied beings astral beings causal beings spiritual souls floating around have no free will not even the illusion of free will they have found out they have gone high enough to know they had no free will even as human beings they are low enough to know that they are not god therefore they have lost what we had as human beings and they haven't got what god alone has because of this it has been said that the human being is closest to god he is made in the image of god that these two experiences of choice and choosing this or that only lie with these two human being and god nobody else so although one should imagine that as one grows spiritually as one progresses through different levels of consciousness one would get more and more free will or lose more and more free will it doesn't happen like that the moment we go up we lose our illusion because of knowledge and yet we do not have enough knowledge to to regain it till we have the ultimate final knowledge of our true reality and we get the whole of it back this is the truth about free will that if you are human and consider yourself separate you have free will of ignorance and if you are god that means you have reached total consciousness then you have free will of knowledge between these two positions you have no free will at all the law of karma is restricted to the mental plane therefore never reaches the level of god the law of karma is a mental action the soul and spirit of a human being transcends the mind therefore it cannot be experienced the truth cannot be experienced while we are still in the mind so long as we think think hard think hard we will never experience oneness you can try your best think as much as you like the more you think the more you create separateness nobody has been able to create oneness by thinking nobody has come anywhere near the single consciousness called god by thinking about it on the other hand if sometime through that strange magic called intuition coincidence strange circumstances and blessings of of god upon us in our physical life we do get that sudden exposure to that oneness it is the thinking of the mind that destroys that exposure and destroys the experience how many of us have seen miracles we all seen miracles miracles happen every day who destroys the miracles our own thought you start thinking about a miracle you will find some excuse some cause to say oh this can be explained and once a miracle is explained it is no longer miraculous what is miraculous which cannot be explained today we can explain how the flower grows and what chromosomes create the beautiful colors so it's no miracle but if a man were to walk in the air and we can't explain it's a miracle just because the mind cannot explain we call it miraculous and if the mind can explain it is no longer a miracle so we are every day turning the beautiful divine miracles of our life into ordinary explainable circumstances and coincidences because the mind can explain them the reality of oneness stays with us as oneness when we transcend the thinking mind so long as we think hard about these things there is no way of getting to oneness people want to experience oneness with their thoughts and oneness has also been called by another word you must have heard that it's called love that is why the same oneness which we call god has also been called love you heard that love is god and god is love why because it is oneness it is this characteristic of god which makes it love it is this characteristic of love which makes it god oneness there is one there are no two therefore it is god therefore it is love what do we do we try to think about this also this beautiful experience of oneness of realizing the oneness of consciousness of every living thing every created thing we try to think about it so we reduce it to what we call togetherness and we think that oneness and togetherness are the same thing the mind cannot go beyond togetherness when we say we love somebody we use this word love we talk of togetherness with that person however together you might be there is still space however together you might be you are still two you are not one together means you are two together how can that be oneness how can we expect the beauty and joy of experience of oneness while we are together 
togetherness means we are attached. Attachments means a mental activity. You can by thought, by thinking about people, thinking about things, thinking about property, thinking about other things that you want to acquire, get attached to them. When you are attached, then you have togetherness, not oneness. You can be attached to things, but you cannot love them. Therefore, when you are attached to things, you are not moving in the direction of oneness. In attachment, there is pain. In attachment, there is suffering. In attachment, there is disappointment. In attachment, there is miscommunication. In attachment, there is misunderstanding. All these things happen where you talk of togetherness. It never happens in oneness. Oneness transcends understanding. Oneness transcends the mind. Therefore, it is only in the state of oneness when you are above the mind that you can really talk of true knowledge and you can talk of true free will which is the same as the will of the Lord. When people say, live in his will, don't use your free will. Live in his will. What they are really saying is, don't think too much about what you have to do. See the writing and the directions around you which he has written. See the language of God around you and act accordingly. Don't act according to the language of your own mind. The language of God is the one that the mind doesn't speak. It is the language of coincidences, circumstances, the signs that come to us without our thoughts, that tell us where to go when we haven't even thought about them, against which the mind revolts. The mind doesn't want to go in that direction with the circumstances and coincidences are pointing us. That's the language of God. If we want to live in the will of oneness or God, we should rather live by the language of coincidences and circumstances than by the language of our own thoughts. And that is called living in God's will. Those who are able to experience living in God's will alone are free from the trap of the illusion of human free will. Otherwise, we are trapped because we use our mind all the time. To come back to the original subject, the law of karma is real if we take our minds as real. The law of karma is real if we take our thoughts as real. The law of karma is real if we govern our life by thinking about it. But all these laws disappear and we transcend them if we replace thinking with love, if we replace understanding with realization, if we replace attachments and greed and avarice for things with real oneness, with real love, which is different from all the attachments. Thank you very much. On this uh, presentation or on, I mean, on what I said or on what I didn't say. Yes. You said that you uh, came to knowledge by having the direct realization that you're God. Um, is it possible that we're trying to understand that one is God? You know, it almost seems like you're trying to use our understanding. You're trying to make us understand that we are God. It is not possible. It is not possible through understanding to understand that you are God. That's why we don't understand we are God. But it is possible through understanding to know that understanding cannot give us that knowledge. No. What you are saying is, what you are understanding is that the concept of being God, of being one, is beyond the mind as we use it. That's what the realization when it comes, you are using the word understanding. What you are realizing is that the thinking process that gives us these understandings is not what you are getting, but you are getting that experience which we, I call intuition. If you use the word intuition, it will fit in more with what you are saying. Yes? What do you think of the definition of truth as that which corresponds with reality? Is that true? True. But I would uh, still subscribe to the view that truth and reality are those that do not change. Neither does truth nor reality. What changes is neither true nor real. But there is degrees of reality. And reality is different, differently used. The word reality is differently used from truth because of one level of awareness being more real or less real. For example, if you go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream, the dream looks real. When you wake up, the dream becomes unreal. The level of reality has changed. And this becomes real. 
wakeful state, if you wake further up from here, this becomes unreal. Then something else becomes real. Therefore, there are what we might call degrees or levels of reality depending upon the level of awareness or consciousness. But truth remains the same. The truth is the ultimate reality. Truth is that which never changes and what is ultimately real is that which never changes. Thank you. Yes. When we have a dream in relation to this wakeful state, this wakeful state looks real. The dream looks unreal on waking up. When we have an astral experience, this wakeful state looks like a dream. That's the secret of finding out, have you really had an astral trip? People try many methods and they have a wonderful dream and they come back and this looks real and they can tell what a wonderful experience we had. But if you really had an astral experience, then when you come back, it will look like a dream. That will look like being awake. So there are, there are levels of wakefulness, levels and levels of wakefulness. Dreams are of many kinds which we have and there are some simple ways of finding the difference. Most of the dreams that we have are monocolor. Have you noticed that? The dreams that we have are one color, not black and white, but a buff colored, buff and different shades of buff. All the dreams we have, those are the real dreams which go into a lower level of consciousness. When we wake up into this multicolor, technical, technical world, it looks so real. But then there are dreams which are themselves having blues and greens and those colors, full of technical. Those dreams are not originating from a completely lower level of consciousness. They leave you in doubt whether it was a real dream or it was something of an experience. Then there are dreams which are prophetic, which can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month. You will see they're always full of color. Those dreams, same color that you have here. Then there are experiences which go beyond the consistency of colors and forms. Like dreams where you can use telepathy. As a natural means, that dream is not a dream at all, it's so real. So what we ordinarily call dream is an experience in consciousness that is not in the physical wakeful state. But they're not all the same, at different levels. Yes? I have listened to many lectures, and in all the lectures, you are more or less saying, thinking mind is our worst enemy. And I have not yet been able to place for what is the role of the thinking mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I owe an apology to the mind for discrediting it so much. It's not fair. So what I have been saying about the mind is not fair to the mind. I have been trying to overstate a point and I have been making this overstatement deliberately in this country, saying don't think, start living. Don't think, start loving. I say in this country because everybody is so engrossed in thinking. They think all the time. They think how not to think. <laughs> and I, I, told, I told you the story of a friend of mine who came to me last week and he said, I tried my very best, strived my best, put my effort and I found it was wrong. The Eastern philosophy of effortlessness is the right way. I said, then? You found it? He said, yes. Then I tried very hard to try effortlessness. I am overstating a point. Let me be fair to the mind. The mind is the most useful computer ever designed by anybody in this creation and has been given to us gift without a price. We should use it. It's the best machine that anybody could give to us. It has been given, built into our body. I love it. It's so efficient. It's wonderful. Use it. All I am saying is, don't get used by it. What is happening to us is, we lost our own soul, our own spirit, our own self, and began to think the mind is ourself. No, be yourself and use the mind. Now, what is the role? Good question. What is the role of the human mind? The role of the human mind is to carry out your instructions, to carry out the decisions of the spirit. What are we doing? We are putting the cart before the horse. We are asking the mind, you make a decision for us. Think and tell us what to do. The mind thinks and says, now do this. Very often it goes wrong. 
and we regret why we did things. Do you know we would never regret if we didn't think about the decision? Imagine, look, strain my talking like this, but look at your own life. What we decide by hunch, by intuition, we don't regret. When we start thinking about it and then take decisions, we say, oh, we went wrong. We didn't take that into account because the mind cannot take everything into account. The correct roles for the spirit and for the mind is let the spirit through coincidences and circumstances take the decisions. Which side to go? When you are at crossroads, should I go this way or that way? Follow your hunch. Follow the circumstances around you. Follow the coincidences that the Lord is revealing to you and decide which way to go. Then begin bring the mind in. Say, now I have decided to go this way. Mind tell me how quickly can I go. Use the mind. Use the mind to implement, carry out the decisions of the spirit. Not the other way around. What we are doing, we are asking the mind, tell us mind after thinking. Let the thoughts tell us what to do. And when the thoughts tell us we don't know how to do it, then we say, Lord, help us. If you put in the wrong things, then the spirit has to come and help us. Put the thing straight, then mind is very useful. I am paying the best compliment to the mind by saying, it's the most efficient thing you will ever find. You give it a direction, it will carry it out. If you don't give it a direction, it runs haywire. And that's called thinking. <laughs> Use the mind. Use the mind. W work with it. Yes. Yes. In ultimate reality, the whole basis of time, space, going through events is illusion. Now, that's a good question you ask because reincarnation is linked with the reality of time. Right? What is the reality of time? What is time? Let us examine it from where we are. As physical human beings at a physical plane, what is time? Time is that which gives us an experience of past, present and future. When we classify experience into categories, we create time. See, ah, that's already happened. This is happening now. We're listening to him now. We came in earlier. We'll go back in the future. That's how time is created. Time is a flow we create in which we can put events and classify them into past, present and future. Let's examine the three categories that the mind so conveniently accepts every day and makes us believe it to be real. What is past? Past is that which is gone. You can't do anything about it. You can't touch it. You can't live in it. Can anybody live in the past? No way. You already lived. Gone. So the segment of time which we call past is inaccessible to us except through memory. We can recall it, but we can't live in it. All right. What is the present? The present has no time at all. Not even a second. Not even a fraction of a second. Not even a nanosecond, which is a billionth part of a second. Not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. There is no time at all in the present. Before I can start speaking into the present, its future, the moment it starts past. It is a timeless meeting point between the past and the future. Therefore, present has no time at all. Okay, what is future? Let us see three words of the English or American dictionary and examine what would happen if these three words were struck out of languages. The words are hope, fear, anticipate. Supposing human beings stop hoping, stop fearing, stop anticipating, you know the word future would go along with them? Disappear. Be written off. That means what we call future is being created by us, by an act in the present which is called hoping, fearing, anticipating. And these are not three words. It's only one anticipation. When it's positive, we call it hope. When it's negative, we call it fear. When it's neutral, we call it anticipation. There's only one activity. This one action in the human consciousness creates the future. If this activity does not take place, future does not get created. And to do these three things, we again need the same kind of time like I am talking to you in the present. Now, when I say I am talking to you in the present, which has no time, and yet my words take time, what is the truth? The truth is I am talking to you in the immediate past. You can only understand me if I talk in the immediate past and you can remember what I said. 
every word I speak, you hear in the past, you remember, therefore you know what I am talking. Otherwise you never understand what I am talking. And to hope and to fear and to anticipate requires time of the same kind, therefore it must take place in the past. You cannot do this activity of hoping, fearing and anticipating except with time which must be in the past. Then only you can do it. When you have a hope, I hope this happens, it comes to you, it takes time. And by the time you hope any single experience, it's already been in the past. Therefore, you are creating an illusion of present, an illusion of future with the reality of a past. So past is past, present is past, future is past. And the only way to experience past, whichever category it is, is through memory. And memory is only possible if it has happened and you can remember where did it happen. Nothing that we are experiencing could have happened here by a very examination of the nature of time. Nothing that we are experiencing here could be experienced if it hadn't happened somewhere else where there is no time. Understand this beautiful metaphysical reality, the truth, and you will find something must have happened outside of time, which when placed in the illusion of time became a series of events, whether they are in one lifetime or in number of lifetimes, they are all equal illusions. If we can say there are yesterdays, todays and tomorrows and they are real, then previous life and present life and future life is also equally real. If yesterday, today and tomorrow is an illusion, it is an illusion through which we are passing because we do not understand the reality of time, then past life, this life and future life is also an illusion. We can get out of it. And so the law of karma, the illusion, subsists on this package of illusion, all starting with time. When we rise in consciousness, what happens? We say we should go spiritually develop to a higher level of consciousness. What would happen if we woke up, really woke up, and this became a dream, what we today take to be wakefulness? If we really awoke to a higher level of consciousness, what would we find? We would find the first casualty will be time. Here, time flows only in one direction. And suddenly you will find that your reality permits you to move in either direction. You can also stop time. You can't stop time here. Like you have a movie. A movie is going on. If we watch the screen, we can't stop the action there. But if you have the projector in your hand, you can stop a single frame, view it for a long time, and then let the movie go on. Which means the projector, if you stop it at one frame, gives you time to see a frame in the illusion of the drama that's going on, on the screen. But if you only look at the screen without reference to projector, you cannot have any time to hold any frame. This physical experience we are having is like the illusion on the screen. We can't hold any frame. You can't stop time at all here. Rise to higher consciousness. Awake. You can hold time. Any frame. Rise further to still higher mental consciousness, what is called the causal consciousness. You can go backwards and forward in time, like a forward playing or backward playing of a movie in a projector. And this very life which we think is so real, that all the all the free will is real. We have choice to make. You will find you can replay it over and over again. You make the same choices again and again. You replay the same game again, same life again, same mental choices again, same thinking again, same coming to the same conclusion again. You can see it personally. The beauty of mystic experience is, it is not merely a conceptual explanation of what might be. It is a possible journey to reality. One can personally go and experience these things now and here, not after death. The mystic experience has this beauty. It is an open invitation to reality for anyone who wants to dare and go in. Go in where? Go in within your own self, nowhere else. You carry the laboratory of finding the truth of all these things with yourself all the time. If you rise above the causal time in which you can move in either direction and see that past and future are no different. Actually, if you can go and relive past or go forward and live in advance of the future, what is the difference left? The difference is only here where we cannot do these things. When you can do those things, there is no difference left. But there is a higher level of wakefulness into the spirit beyond the mind which is beyond time. There you will find that what looks like subdivided, having been done, will be done, is being done, 
are all in one single eternal moment, unending moment. They are all together. Only the mind has to be used to spin them out into this frame. That's where our soul resides, our spirit. And still that is called time. Because the entire creation in time can be capsuled into a timeless moment. It's still time. You can rise further to oneness, God consciousness, and find total timelessness. We don't need time or any capsule for experience at all. It is self-generating here, now, then, future, past, all is together, only one. You get this experience. These are not storybook uh, ideals that one can read about them and think about them or that some people, gifted people had this. Every one of us, every human being, child of five years to an old man of a hundred years can personally verify these things. And not many strange postures have to be adopted, not many strange yogas to be done. Only one method has to be followed. Go within, within your own consciousness. That's simple. Truth is simple. The truth is that these realities are within ourselves, can be experienced within ourselves, provided we stop throwing our attention outward all the time. Reverse this flow of attention. Instead of saying, what is there? What is there? What's happening here? What happened then? What will happen now? What will happen tomorrow? Instead of going out all the time with our attention, let's stay in a single timeless now and here. Where is now? A timeless spirit. Where is here? Where the consciousness is. If you are willing to locate yourself in the timeless now here, you will find all the truths and find the verification.